welcome to Spanish 312, Hopscotch, a Latin American Literature in Translation. Uh, today, it's an extraordinary privilege and pleasure to have uh, Professor Cristina Rivera-Gasa um, uh, with me, who uh, we're going to talk about uh, one of her uh, recent books, but she's written many, she's written novels, she's written criticism, uh, nonfiction, uh, poetry, translations. Uh, she's also a professor at uh, the University of Houston in, in Texas, where I believe she directs the first and perhaps the only um, PhD program in, in creative writing in, in, in Spanish. And it's an extraordinary pleasure to have you um, uh, speak uh, and, and be able to chat. We're going to talk about the tiger syndrome, El Mal del Tiger, translated as the, as the tiger syndrome. And um, again, thank you very much uh, for uh, this time. And, and I thought I'd uh, ask, just start with the question, the word that's in the in the title too, the the tiger. Uh, what what drew you to uh, set a, a novel, or, or mostly set a novel, in this mm -hmm. boreal forest in in the Arctic? Um, uh, uh, what, what is it about forests or the far north that's that that drew you? Yeah, well. Hi, hi, John. Thank you for having me here. It's a pleasure to be able to talk about this book. Uh, these many years after I first published it in Spanish and a couple of years after its publication in English. So thank you for um, keeping it alive in a conversation. Uh, there, I mean, there are always many reasons why we write books. Many of them are unknown to us, and they remain unknown for good reasons. But I had a couple of issues that I was very clear about. I, I was, at that time, exploring issues that had to do with distance, about how, uh, how far away we can go uh, while still being understood. So what can we do with language? so that um, we can maintain a connection while slowly but surely moving away when that connection gets broken. That, that was a, a question very clear in my mind. And the other one had to do with uh, more specific um, you know, issues with the, the engineering or writing, if you want to call it that way. I, uh, I wanted to explore the what indirect language does to storytelling and how these, the, the use of the que in Spanish and the that in English presupp presupposes, assumes the, the existence of a larger community, the existence of a series of mediations that we have to go through to make ourselves understood. And in a way, um, I've thought a lot about this quote by Karl Kraus, um, not only in regards to the Tiger Syndrome, but, but uh, about writing in general. Uh, this is something that Walter Benjamin quoted, I believe, in the thesis uh, of, uh, of history. Um, we don't write to be understood. We write because we are understood. Uh, and, and so that is, I don't know, it's very disquieting. And... Uh, enigmatic and powerful, and it's something that I'm usually thinking about when I write, general, generally speaking. I, I was reading, I, I saw on Twitter a couple of days ago, you'd posted um, something that I think you were reading, it was a quotation uh, along the lines that uh, we don't read novels for plot or character. We read them for atmosphere, and, and that's why we, we, we return to them. And though, I mean, the, the plot in this book is fairly simple. The characters are, are, are interesting, but the atmosphere really is something that, that sticks with you or sticks with the reader. And it has something to do, I think, with the with the tiger, with the, with, with the setting. Um, it, it has something to do with, uh, um, you know, the, the quest and, and, and the, 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 the way in which the, the, the thing is, is, is set up. You're looking for something, you're not quite sure what you'll find. Mm -hmm. I wonder if you could say a little bit more about the atmosphere, the the affect or emotion you were trying to uh, yeah. engender through the writing. Well, I'm very glad that you began this question with that quote, uh, which came from my reading of a manuscript of a wonderful book. It'll be, it'll be out uh, soon, I hope. 
Um, it is a, a piece of unique criticism uh, called Tone by uh, Kate Sambrino. And uh, there is a second author. Uh, unfortunately, I'm forgetting the name right now, but it is central to the work because it's, it's collaborative criticism, which you seldom see in, in our midst. And, um, and there, is a, there is there a whole discussion about atmosphere, precisely about what tone is and how we create it and how we read it too. Um, um, and, and so um, in my own work, I've been way more interested uh, in um, in what we do in terms of um, connecting to or sharing an experience with our readers. So it's not only the plot that, that you can follow intellectually, but all these other elements that are attacking you or that you're going through materially when reading, at least that's my bet. That's what I would love to, to see happening. And, and that's what very often ha happens to me when I'm reading. And so, um, here, I uh, there is much we have invested much in in forest culturally. I mm -hmm. mean, uh, in terms of affect, in terms of our um, childhood memories, uh, obviously uh, financially and economically, and in terms of extraction, uh, we have invested as a society. Although that we is 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 just a fiction right here. Like some great investors are are continuously. Um, generating um, yeah, surplus out of the exploitation of these areas. So I wanted to go into these these forests and the forests that I learned about in my in my childhood with all these with with fairy tales essentially. I I wanted to to take the well known plot of um, of fairy tale and detective work because I wanted to take readers into the unknown. So it always works better in my experience when I'm a, when I'm a reader myself, when um, when authors or narrators uh, throw me a line, something that I can feel some somehow safe and secure, and then I, I'll be more willing to go into new territory. And so I, I was trying to to go for something similar right here. So. We share culturally. We share much of of the experience of uh, of forest and forest making through um, through uh, fairy tales, but we also know a bit at least, or I wanted readers to remind them that forests are also places of extraction, and uh, and that social relations and and uh, deeply embedded hierarchies are also part of this world. I've written about forests before uh, and about detective uh, detectives, female detectives before. My the nameless female detective of this story has shown up uh, in several of uh, several short stories of mine. Uh, some of them were published um, last year uh, by Dorothy Project by the same press uh, under the title of. Um, selected the news stories and so you can see um, the these uh, failing detective at work in, um, in in very disquieting cases too too so so she's she's I'm, I'm, I'm kind of uh, lending a hand or she's lending me a hand to go into this other story and uh, I so I wanted us uh, readers and, and narrators and characters to share this experience about being far away, uh, barely understood. Uh, and and that, that is, to me, that's why um, uh, emphasizing issues of atmosphere uh, was so extremely relevant. There's so there's so much here. This is this is such a a, a rich text, and also the things that you're uh, bringing up uh, and now. So uh, the the narrator of the of the book, as you say, is a, a detective, a sort of reluctant detective, as you say, a failed detective, a semi-retired detective, detective, and she's so she's on a quest that is not quite her own. She takes on this she takes on this mission or or case. Uh, to, to go look for this uh, uh, woman and and uh, a man, this couple, 
um, who uh, last heard of uh, somewhere in the Tiger, somewhere uh, in the north. And so part of what we're reading is, is a sort of report back, is her report back, and we're, we're and, but it's also very intimate at the same time. I, I, I wonder if, and, and it's about her feelings, and it, as you say, in this uh, place that she's never been before, where everything's a little strange, where she doesn't speak the language. I, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that combination of intimacy on the one hand, which I think is, is very profound, but also, again, a report, a, a sort of third, there's always a third person in mind, uh, a, an audience in, in mind for the writing here. Oh, absolutely. And that's that's a part of the, this continuous mediation that we have to be aware of, uh, uh, however unconsciously, as we continue with the reading, right? So she is uh, she's accepted this job reluctantly, as you said. Um, uh, this, this man who has had two wives, that's a pretty much what we know about him, is uh, is intrigued. He wants to know where the second wife is, is going. The only thing that he knows is that he's, she's run away, apparently, with another man. And she's been receiving some intriguing pieces of uh, correspondence, some uh, letters and some telegrams. Who writes telegrams these mm -hmm. days? Come so that, that talks to us, or should in any case, talk to us about uh, space, but also about time. What, what is the time element right here? Who uh, in this day and age is still writing telegrams? Well, and, uh, and so we know at least, what we know is that this, this woman who has uh, failed miserably in, in several previous cases, and you have the books so that you can go back and actually uh, learn about these specific cases, um, she's she's gone, and uh, and she has to learn to to move in this in this um, in this forest uh, in these edges of the world, and because he had because she has to survive essentially it's not it's not an option, and since this is a job she has to report back and that's the writing, so it, it's not a writing that is um, selflessly generated. It's a writing that is aiming for a very specific audience. But at the same time, she's she's writing from a very unstable place where the public and the private are not necessarily um, uh, clearly separated, right? So there is a lot of uh, what you might call personal, personal intimate uh, rumination about what she's going through, much of what she's not very clear about, right? But but she's reporting that. And uh, and the, she's in a way creating an archive. So she's not resorting to an archive, but creating one and trying to make that archive understandable. First, to the man who has hired her. I mean, this is a commercial relationship, and I mm -hmm. think that's very to me at the, at the beginning of the story, this is not a quest for knowledge. This is in many ways a quest for money and, uh, and resources and, and, uh, and surplus is what is being generated also in this forest. So I, to my mind, there is a connection between what she's doing. I mean, she's not an innocent um, uh, character right here, but she's been moved perhaps by the same kind of values that, that are devastating this area of the world. But well, so I, I guess that that combination of the highly personal and intimate and, and at the same time, um, the very objective uh, kind of information that she has to share with her boss, um, it's, it's precisely uh, we think that that, that, um, that cycle of, uh, of, um, of uh, extraction and, and, and ganancia and surplus, right? Accumulation, that's the word I was looking for. Yes. <laughs> and, and it makes me think as well. So on the one hand, uh, as we've said, as, as you said, that the, the forest is certainly new to her. Um, it, it's all unknown, and it, it's 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 kind of strange and un uncanny. Lots of uncanny things uh, happen in these sort of frontier towns. But also, she's following a trace. She's 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 not the first to be there in in two senses. Both that the she's she's following this couple that that's part of the mission. You talked about fairy tales. One of the fairy tales that you mentioned explicitly is, is Hansel and Gretel. So she's following these these, these um, uh, breadcrumbs right through the forest. 
Um, but also, this is not, as you're saying, this is not untouched forest, right? This is this is forest that has actually already, to some extent, uh, been incorporated within a, a global, you know, capitalist extractive uh, uh, system, uh, uh, as you say. So, uh, and and yes, the, the people who've been there before and the people who who are there already. It, it, it reminds me what we were talking about briefly before we started this this conversation, before we started recording. About the uh, you were talking about language as always having been used before, right? It's uh, I think you know it's always secondhand to some extent. Mm -hmm. You're always um, writing yourself into mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, something that is 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 not just yours, right? You're not just your invention. I wonder if you could talk about this notion of something that pre-exists the book, something that pre-exists the narrative and the quest and the plot. Well, um, wow, that's that's a huge, huge question, and it, it might take more than more time than we have. But um, um, in many ways, uh, I've been exploring this idea of disappropriation as a as a way of explaining a type of aesthetics that um, is very aware of the pre-existing voices and and texts that we used to. Um, uh, in order to inscribe what we write into traditions that are larger than ourselves, obviously. And such inscription doesn't mean that we, I mean, that we recognize the traditions. It doesn't mean that we assume and honor them fully, right? I mean, you can recognize a tradition and, and try to subvert that tradition with your own um, strategies and elements. And uh, the whole thing uh, gives... Uh, we might we, we could have a longer much longer conversation about this but in this case i i took advantage of uh, of these short stories that i that i believe are so ingrained in our cultures that we all have a, a, a connection however feeble to it and uh, to plots that are very much ingrained in um, in our daily lives not only in our reading lives so um, here we have uh, this, uh, this detective uh, even quoting works and stories that, that we know about fe uh, feral ch children, about um, um, authoritarian um, uh, uh, politicians and, and investors. And, and it, the thing is that, uh, let me see, there is a way of, quoting that in a way honors this subterranean conversation that I believe books are part of. Again, briefly before we, we talked about a stylistic, um, I, I don't know, a, a stylistic approach that, that you use in writing this, which is perhaps less apparent in the translation, but it's still apparent. Um, uh, the fact that uh, it's often written as if it were reported speech. You use this, uh, the Spanish cape, which is, you know, mm -hmm. that, essentially. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. uh, as, as if the, 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 the book or much of the book were in quotation, as, as, you, as you say. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the, your choices about how, how you chose to, to, to use that particular structure in so much and so insistently in this particular book. It, I think it went hand in hand with the issue of distance. Um, the the little uh, phrase that, that I, I believe you quoted in your lecture it's a it's a it's a verse by Vallejo, Cesar Vallejo, uh, about, about distance becoming too close to us, right? And in a world in which bodies seems seem to be both rapidly disappearing in our virtual lives and and. Uh, and full of suffering too in our daily lives. It's very strange that issue of distance. I think is very central to to how we see and understand the world in, we, in which we live, and um, and how we may prepare critically, you know, to to imagine some other kind of worlds. So here, uh, the only way that I that I that I had, or the, or the way at least that I chose to make that distance palpable was precisely this indirect speech. So if we say, 
que, que la tierra estaba muy fría y todo mundo se escondió. So, that, that the forest was really cold and everybody went into hiding. So, that that, what, uh, what is asking us to, to ponder is who is saying that? So, right, que la tierra. So, someone said that, someone had experienced that before. And the book is not telling us who that is. So the book is, is consistently hiding or trying to conceal or at least making it difficult uh, for you to know who is behind that cave. Very often it is the, the, the detective herself, but often it is not. And, uh, and I, I guess you don't have to, to, to be consciously aware of this. This is not something intellectual. Right. This is something. This this is a kind of enigma that is growing slowly, and that is getting to a different side of your brain. Uh, the one, a different side of your body, I should say, of your perception. So you, it, what what I do when I find those kind of sentences is, what, wow, there is something here that I'm not learning. There is something here that I have to be paying attention to. And that, that um, the, the search of these questions, I think, is the other side of the book, the, the one that we are writing with the author and the one that, in, that uh, um, is telling us that your implication as a, not only as a reader, as an intellectual reader, but an implication, your carnal implication, so to speak, with the book it is going to be central for, 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 for you know, the, the whole experience of reading. Our time's almost up. I, I, we, we could talk for a much longer. I have two or three quick questions. I'm trying to fit in. If we, if I don't, then, then so be it. What you were just saying made me thought, or made me think also about the role of translation. It, it's in the plot too, because um, uh, the translator is one of the central characters. The the detective uh, uh, hires uh, this translator who who accompanies. Uh, they're sort of a double of the initial um, pair, and and they and they mm -hmm. again they they inhabit the same spaces as they're going through, but but this translator is there as as a as a mediating uh, instance. I wonder if you could say a little bit about the role of translation within the book, and then of course, uh, in, in in this course, um, the students are reading the book in trans in in translation, and you've been translated and you have translated as well. I, I wonder how. What, what you were trying to say about translation uh, here in the Tiger Syndrome? Well, I have the highest respect for translators. Uh, I really think that the, the closest, uh, more most perceptive of readings is done through the translation. You have to make, as you well know, there is a lot of decision making as you're trying to move language and meaning from one uh, world into another. Uh, and so, I, this is an experience that I've had uh, um, quite often, not only working with translators, which is a very collaborative, very plural practice. I think all writing is, but we see it more clearly when a, translation, a translator is involved. So what translation does is that it kind of uh, sheds light on something that writing is always doing. We're always translating uh, when we write. As, as some people said, I don't remember the author right now. I'm quite forget, forgetful today. Huh? But um, and that translation is original, actually, right? Mm -hmm. And I do believe that. And um, I've... I've written some, I've, I've done some translations myself, a couple of books, more recently, Fred Moten's The Under Commons, wow. uh, which I did in collaboration with two, or, with two more translators. And that very much speaks of, uh, of the type of um, work that, that I believe uh, it's, it's central to, to writing as, as this collaborative uh, communitarian uh, Communality, as I as I call it in Spanish, it's una comunalidad. It's not only a community, but a comunalidad, right? And and on the other hand, um, having gone through those exercises and having lived in the United States for more than thirty years, working quite often in English as well, I think I've I've gotten used to to write in a translation mode. So even if I'm writing in Spanish, I'm very aware of the resonances and the structures 
and the possibilities that English offers to me. And the same happens when I'm writing in English. And, and in fact, my um, most recent work, uh, the book that is going to be out by the end of February, uh, Liliana's Invis Invincible Summer, uh, it's a it's a work that I've written both in English and in Spanish. So this is work uh, rendered thanks to this um, translation mode of writing. We'll see how that goes with readers. Wow, I'm I'm looking forward to that. So I will ask one more question, especially sparked perhaps by your mention of the Undercommons. I I, I love that book, and um, amongst other things. Uh, it talks about, uh, I can't remember the phrase exactly that they use, a sort of fugitive intellectuality, right? And, and your book is also about an escape, right? An attempt, attempt to escape. Yeah. And in some ways, they do, They, I mean, the the the, the fleeing ex-second wife and, and, and never brought mm -hmm. back. But on yeah. the other hand, it also seems to me that your book is in part about the impossibility of escape in the ways that we've been talking about, right? That someone's always been there before. That you're always, whether you like it or not, if you're using language, part of a, a community, part of a tradition, uh, uh, which you can never fully uh, deny. Otherwise, that there's no possibility of communication, of, of translation, and so on. So I wonder what, yes, that sort of figure of escape and fugitivity. How, how you see you see that? How oh, interesting! Uh, I, it reminds me of that book, Escape Routes. I. And again, uh, we will have to Google the, the author. I don't remember the authors right now, but uh, claiming very much as I've said for translation, that translation is original, is uh, claiming that escape is is the is the original experience. Uh, constraint and sedentarism comes after that, right? And uh, I think you have to work really hard to create those vanishing points. Uh, uh, I think we remain inside in, uh, in, in, uh, uh, in many, many ways, of course. And uh, even when we, and I'm talking here as a writer, even uh, and a writer who, who is very much interested in experimental, so-called experimental uh, type of strategies, trying to find the, the cracks, uh, those, those, um, those little spaces, interstices that, that, that might make um, imagining a different world possible. And, and the point is that we all know capitalism is very good at it, reincorporating everything back in, right? So keeping that going without resorting to speed or acceleration, right. I think that's, that's the big challenge to me. I'm trying to think about that very carefully. Well, what a way to end this 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 conversation uh, thank you so much uh, professor rivera gasa this has been a a, a fascinating discussion of, of what is a, a magnificent book and um, thank you for your time and and sharing a, a little more of your thoughts no thank you thank you for your reading and this conversation and hi to all the students in your classes